So what is Azure Function? So Azure Function is basically a serverless offering from uh, Microsoft Azure. And the idea is that you can build one nano services which is used to define one services at a time or basically that the context of that service is very narrow. Uh, so it's only defined to use one thing at a time in a serverless mode. I have I've used so many jargons right now, and if you have not worked with Azure functions, you might be wondering what the hell this guy is talking about, right? Uh, let me let me take a moment to explain. So I've used a word called serverless. Let me take a moment and try to give you an explanation of serverless. For the people who knows about it, it's good. Uh, for the people who does not know about it, let me try to clarify it for you. So what is serverless? As the name suggests, server this. So a lot of people think that uh, there is no server. Mm, that's actually not true. So there are servers associated for you, but uh, there is no server dedicated for you. That means you are only gonna be built on the time that you're executing a command or using the computer at that point of time. Otherwise, you will have to be built 24 by 7 if you're utilizing those resources or not. When I say 24 by 7, I mean if you have a dedicated instance running for you. Now, it does not matter whether there is a traffic on those systems or not, you are actually built for that moment of time. Think of it uh, is like uh, having a big kitchen in a restaurant. Now, instead of having a cook in the kitchen uh, all the time, the kitchen only gets use when uh, someone orders food right and uh, just like that when the kitchen is ready to serve you and uh, the cook is cooking only when there is the food a service computing is also a similar thing when uh, there is an order there is a request you do the computing and you will result back the uh, the output of it so you only pay for the time you use the kitchen instead of paying for the whole time, like let's say you can rent out a complete kitchen, but you can also say that, okay, for the time that I'm using and cooking in the kitchen, I'm paying for that time instead of renting it out 24 by seven. Now, if you're renting it out, you know the cost of rent that, okay, this is what I'm gonna pay for, for this space. However, often and not, you're not utilizing the most of it because let's say you are a startup and you know that, okay, it's a shared cloud kitchen model and, uh, the moment you get a request or an order, you can use this shared resources, right? Instead of uh, instead of basically having the whole kitchen to yourself and then having a big chunk bill to yourself as well. So serverless computing also works in a similar manner. The idea is that uh, instead of having a dedicated instance or dedicated computing associated to you, you basically say that, okay, I am using a serverless model. So that means it's more going to be on the computing side so whatever i consume so you can design a consumption model and it's like uh, whatever i am consuming based on that i will be paying the the bills accordingly so it basically helps you in a sick a uh, making sure that you're saving some money because as we are saying that only paying for what you're utilizing instead of having some dedicated computing and unutilized computing uh, one part of my job is to make sure that I'm able to cut the cost down in my organization on Azure because we are a SaaS based company and uh, the profits basically relies on the consumption of Azure and optimizing the resources as well. So it's very important for me to make sure that we are not overspending and we are constantly monitoring the cost of uh, our resources and also cutting down on the costs as well. And uh, when I say cut down, that does not mean that I should trim down the servers if we are utilizing them, but uh, to identify how much we are utilizing and how much we can save. So the idea remains the same over here as well in serverless that uh, instead of paying for the whole dedicated, you are paying for exactly, exactly what you are using. And uh, Azure Functions specifically is a serverless offering from uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, to build function as a service and I have used the word nano services because I want to amplify a concept saying that uh, the overall 
concept or the context of one function should be very vivid. I think there are a lot of people who does not understand that and they try to over complify the designs of a function. Uh, I do not agree with that phenomena. So for me, the idea of a function should be that it's only going to do one job and one job only. So a function application in Azure can hold multiple functions, but the idea of one function should be to do one job itself. That's it. Uh, let's say if you are building a calculator, like right? so there are different type, uh, APIs that you can do plus like addition, subtraction, multiple division, percentage, all sort of other calculations, right? But the idea is that individual function, for example, additional function is only used for the addition purposes, similarly subtraction, similarly multiplication, and so on and so forth, right? The idea is that the defined context of that specific code should be limited so that A, it's easier to manage and B, it's easier to deploy and then it does not affect the other function as well. So it also goes well with the phenomena of microservice architecture. If you guys have heard about it, the idea is very similar that uh, instead of having one monolithic application, which is uh, difficult to manage, develop and secure, you chunk it down into smaller pieces and then basically deploy it individually so that you can manage it, develop it, and have the whole DevOps lifecycle around it individually as well. Um, having said that, I am going to go on to the next step uh, and talk a bit more about uh, Azure Function. So Azure Function is, as I said, is a serverless offering, but uh, think of Azure Function uh, like a, is like a toolbox. Like I've been talking about uh, having a specific request of having a specific use case of, of a single function. So like a toolbox, there are multiple tools. Every tool has its own function, like a screwdriver is used to unscrew a screw, a screw right? Similarly, uh, a wrench is used to tighten up the nuts. Similarly, every tool well, in a toolbox, every tool has a unique uh, facility or a functionality that we are about to explore, right? Or about to be used. Um, the idea is you have to use the right tool in order to make the most of it or basically you can also use some other tools and make it work somehow but it's better to use the right tool and then have the most of the functionality that is provided by the tool right similarly that will be the case in the azure function as well that you identify the initial uh, use cases of it and then design it in a way that uh, all of the azure functions does one thing but one thing well right as we know that a screwdriver can screw all the screws in the world but of course depends on the size of the screws and there are some limitations but for majority of the screws right it will be able to screw and unscrew it right um similarly for wrench you know that okay it's universal it's something that you can use across the world right so the idea is to make sure that you do one thing but one thing will and they've designed these services in a concept of what I call, or I like to call as nano services in the, instead of microservices as well. Um, what are the different languages that are supported? Uh, JavaScript, C Sharp, Python, PHP, all PowerShell, Bass, Batch. So if you work on any of these things, these are supported. You can design your, as your functions in it and uh, develop uh, and then deploy in it. What are the different uh, scenarios or use cases of an Azure function? I think it's important to understand because before we go into the securing part of it, we need to understand the use cases as well, like it, because we need to explore what kind of use cases that will be provided by Azure function and then we'll think about security. I have done plenty of uh, Azure function sessions in the past, so if you to search it on YouTube, we'll be able to find me uh, spending a more detailed instructions about Azure functions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in explaining these, but if you are someone who's new to it, you will be able to find a lot more content that's meaning about it. Um, there are better people who have explained Azure functions in a much nicer way now, and uh, my previous sessions would be quite old. I think around three, four years back, I have presented on Azure functions. So, you can find another guy's explaining in a much nicer concept in a much nicer way. But the idea is that if you don't know about it, you can explain, you can basically get more information, but I'm gonna jump on a very 10,000 feet overview to make sure that we get to the actual topic as well. Because what I'm doing right now is more of a prerequisite 
for the actual topic, which is securing Azure functions. But uh, I'm spending some time on the Azure functions right now to start with. Uh, common scenarios. So there are different kind of uh, scenarios. Basically, it can be used for mobile backend. It can be used for. Um, it can be used for even processing any ways, any request that comes in. I use it. We use it for multiple purposes. Whenever there is a new blob, do something. Whenever there is a new file, do something. Whenever there is X. Uh, so it's more of an event, right? That you're generating when I'm saying, let's say, whenever there is a new file uploaded to a blob, then uh, copy this file and then create a backup of it, all sort of other tasks that you can assign to it. So this is nothing but an event based architecture. So wherever you need an event based architecture, your function is nice. Similarly, bot messaging, we know that, okay, people are not interacting with bots 24 by 7, but uh, there might be scenarios where they are based on the kind of uh, offerings that you are hosting for your company, right? Um, but if let's say, if it's a small company, you will not be having the calls 24 by 7 because your major of the majority of the customer will be working on a specific time zone so you can expect a lot more uh, calls on the servers at from um, 9 to 5 on a weekday but you will not expect a lot of calls over the weekend so on those kind of scenarios uh, you can build the backend on Azure functions and then uh, put it on a function and whenever there is a request it will basically uh, put it on the server and then deploy it the first calls have often delayed actually, so it's not very fast. Let's say if the server has been paused, if the, if the function has been paused, and then you are trying to make a call to these, then it takes a lot of time. But uh, it's not a lot of time as well. Like, don't take me wrong in this scenario. It's like a couple of seconds. But uh, the preceding calls uh, are much more faster. So it's more real time from the next two calls itself. So there are different type of triggers that you should know about. Blob um, trigger, and I gave you an idea that okay, whenever there is a new blob updated or uploaded, then do some processing. This, if this, then that, kind of scenario. Um, so you can define actually in the that section what exactly you want to do. Similarly, let's say we have GitHub book. If there is a new code published, then do the deployment automatically. If uh, if there is a HTTP trigger, that means uh, you're making a call from from an HTTP request. And also, similarly, if you have a queue trigger, that basically means that uh, if there is a new message in the queue, if there is a new request in the queue, then you basically take it, read it from the queue, and then process it. It's a very uh, design, well-defined design of uh, distributed applications as well that. Um, you can put messages or the request in the queue and then whenever there is a new computing available that will take that node will take the uh, messages from the queue and process it and reply it back similarly for the other type like we have a timer trigger as well and the idea is that every x amount of time you can which you can of course define right uh, this will be automatically triggered and then uh, it will automatically be worked on um so this was about Azure uh, functions and serverless in general. Uh, now the next topic is about uh, security, uh, which is the main topic of this session. Uh, authentication and authorization. I think it's quite basic, but uh, and I kind of hope that you guys knows about it. What is the difference between authentication and authorization? But often and not when I interview people and I feel very sad when I see people, they don't understand the clear definition of what is authentication and authorization. So they both understand it's about logging in, right? Uh, but what is the difference between authentication and authorization in general? Like, right? and that's where I feel sad that uh, a lot of the people are not able to give me a clear definition between both of them. So they are able to say that, okay, authentication and authorization is about it's for logging in and making sure that we have the right credentials in place. Okay, but what is the difference between two? This is where the issue happens. And uh, the issue with security is that if you don't understand security quite well, you'll not be able to secure it well. You are only as secure as your weakest link. Always remember that. So you have to make sure that you are securing every aspect 
of your application because it does not matter if there's a weak link in the overall system it does not matter if you have put a 500 level security on another aspect and zero on one aspect and then it's of no use right because everything's going to fall down sooner or later so authentication and authorization think of it uh, in a scenario like let's say um a friend basically invite you to his home and to basically play some video games now when uh when you come in when you knock on the door you say who's this uh you say this is me Mohit, and uh, they say what is the password you give the password you say they're okay this is me you called me and they identify that they are you that uh, you are the right person that they are opening the door to and you get in now that is authentication how you identify it you basically give your username and password and then you basically get in that means you have authenticated the next step is authorization now let's say uh, the it's it's the role of your friend to make sure that they give you the right authorization so similarly that uh, in the scenario where you're going to play a video game which video game you can play is something that they have decided because they are hosting the party for you, right? The video game, the game party, the game night at their house. So they will basically give you the authorization to play the game. So that's the idea. The authorization basically means that uh, what you're allowed to do once you have been authenticated. And auth authentication is about uh, to make sure that you are the right person. So identifying you are the right person authentication what you're allowed to do is about the authentication also it's about the authorization my bad um now azure functions azure functions has different authorization levels so anonymous as the name suggests there is it's anonymous anyone can call it uh function it's it's by default it's the default setting so a specific key is required and we're going to look into it so don't worry about it and then there's system admin and user so the system is basically where the all the all the other functions within the same host can call it without any authentication ever so like i told you that there are different functions that we can identify like in the calculator example addition subtraction multiple division percentage uh, log whatever right these are different functions but they can call each other because they are in the same host they are in the calculator app services or so calculator functions are uh, defined um on, on the in the app services right similarly admin uh so as the name suggests you need to have a admin credential to do it and you define a master key and admin key uh, for it and then once you have the key only those people who have the key will be able to authenticate and the next is the user that depends on the user based token so you have to define this uh, custom token for the users and the people who have this token will be able to authenticate what are the different ways of protecting um uh, one of them is identity providers and we're going to look into it uh what is identity provider you can use uh, as your ad you can use uh, google gmail or uh, or uh, Twitter or Facebook, any of these providers, right? So the idea is that you have a social plugin that you can utilize and then put it on your on your application. And then people can choose how they want to log in. You can support one or multiple at the same time that you might have seen in multiple applications that uh, people have the option to choose and log in from different login providers. Um, similarly, then we have API management. As the name suggests, it's uh, another option from uh, Microsoft, which is used to manage multiple APIs. And it gives you like a swagger UI and a full console where you can define uh, with API keys and then host your APIs to be consumed by an external agent or an internal agent where you can identify the number of calls they are making to your systems and also identify or so limit their access to these systems. So if you go towards uh, the APIs of Google, let's say if you want to make a translation and so what you're going to do is you're going to go to Google and all ping or whatever, right? Uh, you're going to register yourself as a developer and then make use of their translate API. Like you're not going to write the translation logic yourself. Of course, you can if you want to. I'm not going to stop you on that. But there is a better sense that you're going to use this API, which is already provided by 
Google or Microsoft or, or any other uh, providers, right? So you're gonna use these third-party APIs. So the experience that you get, that you basically register yourself, you get an API key, and then you can use this API key for all the calls that you are making, is something that uh, that basically allows you uh, to authenticate yourself and then also get in and then use this API. So API management gives you that kind of facility which you can provide and give a similar kind of experience for your customers when you're hosting your own API as well. So this is one of the options we're gonna look into it and then uh, network IP restriction. So you can restrict the IPs. Uh, let's say you you know that, okay, there are some malicious people who are trying to attack you. It's the attacks are coming from a specific IP so you can block their IPs. Similarly, manage identities. Manage identities. A lot of time we had to create service principle to make sure that these are the different components of Azure are able to talk to each other, and uh, it's difficult to identify it. So I'm gonna go into the specific uh, side and then talk more about it. Similarly, client certificate and defender and log analytics. I think I I should go to specific uh, slides and then talk more about it. Um, I have. Uh, taken few minutes over here protecting Azure function. I've already talked about it with the identity provider, Facebook, Google, Twitter, GitHub, OpenID. These are the different options that you have. So you can make use of uh, any of these options. Uh, what happens is uh, from the client, uh, you request an award, give a token, and then you get the token back from the API, and then you make the token. Uh, you basically make a call with the token in the header, and then the API validates the token and return back the output with the client. So this is the classic, uh, classic OAuth life cycle of of a call of a token management, and this is same. So it's not rocket science. It's something which is standardized, and uh, you just basically build an app that can call these APIs and then make sure that you're having this token whenever you are making a call to make sure that. Uh, it's authenticated in the right way. And you're putting it in the authorization header to be, to make sure that it's authenticated. Um, what are the different authentication options? In the API management, uh, we have basic options, subscription key or client certificate. And uh, basic, as you, know, as you know that, okay, uh, you can have simple credentials. Subscription key is basically when you have a specific keys, associated with your subscription so anyone having access to subscription key can make a call to this subscription or a client certificate uh, what is a client certificate the certificate is basically where you have a certificate based authentication so people needs to have this certificate installed in their own local machine as well when they are making these calls and then the thumbprint basically is a change and make sure that okay there is a handshake between the client and the server and that's how you authenticate yourself. Mm, it is also useful in some scenarios. I don't, I'm not a big fan of client based certificate because I think there is a lot of downside of it where uh, the strength needs to be, uh, to, client needs to know about the certificate up hand as well, which is not always a right case. But uh, I can also think of a lot of scenarios which I am particularly using as well in my setup where we needed the client based authentication and uh, it is then quite useful um different uh, policies you can limit the rate how many calls we are getting from a specific ip or a specific user because let's say there are a lot of calls that we are getting and bombarding uh it could be a ddos attack we can identify it whether it's a ddos attack and then limit the call or our normal cases where you want to make sure that you're not uh, exploded with a lot of calls from a specific IP or a specific user, you can limit the quota of that call. And also you can put the policies for validating the JWT and JWT is JSON web token. And uh, you can identify and validate that okay, whether this token is correct or not. Um, network restriction, you can say that you need access to HTTPS and uh, you can say that, okay, calls should be enabled and it should not be put to stars so only the selected input points should be used 
and you can also use uh, SS base workstation on the IP and also on the virtual network level. I talk about uh, managed identity and the idea is that uh, if multiple uh, services has to talk to each other, the uh, PVC we had an option of uh, service principles and the issue is that there are a lot of service principles which are curated and uh, what happens is that uh, it's difficult to manage and identify because most of the times people just create the service principle and we have a random query associated to them that after a period of time it's difficult to manage uh, manage identity what it does it is assigned to a resource so there are two types of managed identity system level and user level so you can create your own managed identity and assign to a resource as well or a system level managed identity as well where you your managed identity is assigned to a specific resource and then you can connect to different other resources and make an authentication between these two resources to make sure that resource a and b are able to talk to each other for example uh, your function can talk to as your keyboard or function can talk to the api management so you're putting an authorization saying that okay these two are able to communicate with each other but uh, with a managed identity and device cycle with a system level is whenever you delete the actual resource of managed identity underneath is also deleted automatically. So I'm going to give you a small demo uh, on it. As your functions, I talk about it. Uh, so if you want to use the client certificate, you have to use the HAR client key, client cert key, and then you can enable it. I'm going to show it to you how to do that. Uh, API management, I think, uh, let me go back and then start from the demo because I've been murmuring on this PPT and I think it's quite boring. Uh, so, let me open something which we are going to And uh, I will click on create a new project. I'll search for functions. As your function, C sharp looks good. I'm gonna name it multi cloud demo for you so that all of us are able to identify this. This is the function that we are created and working with. Uh, I am using .NET 6 random support, that's fine. Over here, you see we have different triggers and how you want to start uh, the function, how you're going to trigger the function. So I'm going to use HTTP trigger. So because you want to use the HTTP function and over here, you see the authorization level. Uh, we have function anonymous or admin. So I'm going to keep it to function right now. And then create it. So over here, I am allowing get and post on this, and uh, the function name is function one. I can always change that, but it's not needed for this demo, so I'm gonna just save some time and run it in my local. So I'm not gonna make any change, but the idea is that it's a simple template that I'm using, and then it looks for the HTTP trigger and. Uh, if you see over here in the bindings, I have a HTTP request as an input, and based on the request, I will identify whether it's a get or post and then run it accordingly. And uh, I am looking for uh, I'm looking for a name in the query, and based on the based on query, I'm basically replacing name over here. 
So over here, this forms, I'm checking whether uh, something happened. Uh, good. Let me see if we build it and see. But over here, I'm checking if the name is empty, is null or empty. If it's empty, then I'm saying that okay, please uh, pass in the name. Otherwise, if the name is present, then we say hello. This, this function has been executed successfully. Let me we run it now. I think it's running now. <coughs> it's gonna take a few seconds. Uh, So it says that, okay, uh, this function is ready and uh, I quit on it. And okay, I think it's quite slow. This is quite low. Let me try to zoom in. I don't use, uh, but I think I should use my Google Chrome because uh, Chrome is gonna give me a better view that at least you guys can you uh, see or read. So HTTP trigger that it is successfully. Please pass in a name. So how I'm gonna pass it a name? I'm gonna put it in the query string and uh, let me a sec. So you see, uh, I put a percentage twenty. I've put the additional space. So I have a more da 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 da. So it took the request and then replaced my name from the query string. Nothing, nothing special, but uh, a very basic template that I wanted to show you because I didn't wanted to focus on the functionality of the code, but uh, what you can do with the overall functions. Um. So now you have this function. I'm gonna, oh, I accidentally stopped the sharing. So let me share. I wanted to stop the, with the studio, it said I stopped my sharing, my bad. I hope you are able to see my screen again, now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Wait, so I wanted to stop with the studio, which I should do it now. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to push it to Azure and then start securing it. So one of the way I'm pushing right now is with the directly like we publish. We should never do that. Uh, but just for the sake of this demo, I'm going to take this liberty of uh, pushing it directly from Visual Studio. You should have your pipelines configured and uh, via pipelines, you should be basically triggering it with your CICD. And, uh, you should not take this liberty because this is a demo and uh, the implications are quite low because it's a demo and it's a demo environment that I'm pushing to. It's my personal subscription and uh, also a demo application. That's why I'm pushing it from here, but uh, not the best way of doing it, just so you know. So I'm going to create new. You can also do this from uh, from the Azure portal. I'm just doing it from the Visual Studio itself. It's the same kind of a wizard, a different UI, but in the end you have to provide the same thing. It doesn't matter.
So I'm going to put it on East US. Let me put it on bunch of demo. So I'm creating, it's putting this random string. Let me see if it, this is a variable. Yeah, this is a variable, so I don't want a random text associated to it. It's more readable. Putting it in East US on a existing function demo group and not creating a new one, I, although I can create a new resource group as well. I'm putting it on a consumption mode. And uh, you can also put it on an app service plan. So if you already have an app services, you can put along with it and you only have to pay for the app service plan itself and not the consumption model that you're using for other functions. Um, for this, I'm gonna use the consumption model, create a new resource. It's going to take a minute before it's uh, created and published, so we have to be patient. Unfortunately, uh, till this is done, we have to wait. And uh, we still have people joining in, so let me get them in. So it's created. I couldn't put it in a slot, but I'm going to, instead of that, I'm directly putting it on the application and publishing it. So basically, deploying this application directly from Visual Studio to this uh, new Azure function that we have created. And uh, let it complete the profile, then I publish. Done. Let me publish. Public is going to take another 30 seconds. It's publishing, so let's wait. Should be done any second now. It says publishing succeeded, but I'm waiting for this function app to be ready. It should take another 20 seconds, probably. It's putting in these settings right now. Very dating. Function up is ready. Nice. And it's 
six correct my function app is ready it's ready to be used nice uh, let me go to the azure portal and check it out let me bring my azure portal over here and go to this guy and go to the function apps multi cloud demo for you come down two functions Adding a parameter. I see AK as one of the participants, so I'm going to use his name. So we tested that it's working fine. Let me also try to use this function URL. You see over here when I'm using function new level because I put the level as function, then a code is associated over here in order for this to be authenticated. Now what I have to do, I have to run this and see the HTTP trigger. Da, 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 da. Please pass a name in the query string. So we remember we have this uh, conditional statement. So it's getting in. The code is getting executed. I just have to put the conditional statement uh, query. I see another name as Adino as one of the participants. I'm use, gonna use his name. And sorry, instead of query, I should pass name. I already know that HTTP triggered successfully. So this is update now. How we can secure it now? If I I put it on Azure, one of the ways of securing it is going to the authentication and then putting an authentication on top of this. So I'm gonna put an identity provider. And I mentioned that there are different options that you can have, uh, be it Facebook, Apple, GitHub, Google, Twitter, OpenID. I'm gonna use uh, Microsoft for this demo purpose. And uh, here, what we really happens is you are, have to create a new application in the Azure AD. So you need to have the right access. If you don't have the right access on the Azure AD, you have to need to ask the Azure AD, AD admin to create it in the, for you, I own this ID, so I can write recreate it right from the here itself. Um, so I'm creating a new app registration. I'm not going to use an existing app and mess it up with it. Uh, so it's going to be a single tenant. That means only people who are present in my tenant are able to get in. But you can also create a multi-tenant application, and also someone that has a Microsoft account can get in. Depends on different time kind of. Uh, Use cases you have for this demo, I'm gonna keep it for single tenant for only people who have access to my uh, tenant can get in. So if you are gonna try it out, we will not be able to get into this application and use it. Restriction level, I am saying that, okay, uh, only people who have the authentication should be able to get in and people who does not have this should get a 302 level. Permission, it's gonna take a read request and then gonna read it from there. So I'm going to add this uh, identity provider. So what's happening behind the scene is it's creating an application in Azure AD and then configuring it. So it's created this app ID over there in the Azure AD and then authenticated with it. So now if I, I have this URL, if I try it again, it's still giving me the result. And that is because I am authenticated. Let me try it in an incognito mode. So I'm in an incognito mode right now and try to run it with this. Uh, I think I'm authenticated in this as well, which is so wrong. Uh, let me try it in here. Give me a sec.
right so you see i'm was not authenticated in this browser so it's asking me to log in and uh, on the application and giving me the assist so i accept it and because i logged in from the id which is part of the tenant i'm able to log in and i have the assist although so the text is very small but i can i hope you're able to see uh, in it I, i'm not able to zoom a lot but hopefully now you're able to see it so one of the ways you can secure is it with the identity provider that we talked about and uh, coming back to yes to the azure portal the another options is with the certificate so you can create a certificate or import your own one being your own certificate as well and i'm not going to go on to that but uh, this is important you can affect the restriction of uh, the users based on their network so you can say only a specific network uh, that you have already defined can be able to make calls to this uh, uh, this app services or Azure function and uh, you can come over here in the state position and uh, if you see over here you can add the name and over here you can choose either a virtual network or ip addresses or you can do choose service tags and based on the tags depends upon okay that you say okay only the calls from the api management or or action groups or logic app or from from west india should be able to or the uk west so you can identify different connectors and then based on that you can choose whatever is suitable for your uh, requirement in the tax but uh, you can do the ip level restriction as well and then putting the ips that okay block these oops block these ips i can identify my ip and then put it it's a small demo but i think all of you understand that i'm running out of time so i'm not going to show you the demo but i think it's pretty straightforward you put in your ip and then it will be blocked and uh, you can block it out apart from that uh, you can define the course over here so the idea is that uh, only a specific request coming from a specific origin will be able to get back to your backend and able to uh, interact with your backend so you can enable the credentials if it's not needed you can at least define the origins and then make sure that it's uh, coming from a right source for the all the course requests and not uh, style so there are a lot of people who put style to have our use style uh, people see this and put a style it's not the best use case so make sure you know what you're doing before you're doing it and uh, apart from that i can quickly go to the api management and uh, create one i think we are running out of time but i'm going to take a couple of minutes and let me create a new one Let me put my email. Let me do a refresh. Now, if you know how much money I have in my subscription, so let me close it out. Is in the transitioning state. Um, let me go to the API management store. Right. So here as well, you can use a subscription level key for all your requests that's one i'm not going to show it to you now because we are out of time you can put authorization and authentication over here as well uh, you can use the system managed identity that i was telling you about so 
system managed identity as the name suggests it will be assigned to this uh, api management and the moment this api management is deleted the api the managed identity underneath is deleted as well uh, so it's still in the transitioning phase so it's going to take some time uh, but you understand how to do it just click come here and click on save and you can also put your open out on or open id connect to the api management as well but something that i wanted to quickly show you is in the api side and cut this off api oops api add api it should basically show the existing api because it's in a transition state what i'm going to do i'm going to use my previous api just to quickly show you how does it look like uh, it's going to take few minutes before it's loaded over there but we do not have few minutes so i'm going to use this as a quickly show where i'm going to say that okay i'm putting it in the oven and now the cake is ready so you don't have to wait for the cake to be ready now i'm going to show you this that Go to api the cake is ready and uh, you see i have the current apis will be shown like this and then you can have different policies or inbound inbound is basically for all the requests that is coming in and outbound is all the requests that is going out uh, so if you want to modify it you can put different policies to it for example all the requests you can say that okay i talk about ip filtering you can do ip filtering from here as well Similarly, you can limit the weight. Uh, you can say that, okay, that don't make uh, more than X amount of call from a specific IP or from a specific key or a specific user, or you can validate the query uh, or the headers as well. You can set the calls policy. So validate the JWT token upfront before going to the front, uh, to the function itself. Uh, and then you can also look for the cache. So you can say that, okay, instead of going to the database, first catch the uh, cache and then if not then go to the database and do a database query um, similarly for the outbound you can also for the outbound do similar stuff where you can put the headers and then put the validating content and then put more custom policies as well depends on your use case you can define the status code which you can handle it in your code base as well that okay specific case and this is how i'm gonna throw an error or throw an, an uh, response so but all of these policies will basically be generated here and will go here and uh, yeah you can put uh, manage identities here or you can also put the certificates that i will talk about so we can create certificates or i or basically take it from key vault i'm not going to do it for right now but uh, i talk about managed identity so you can create the managed identity a system level one and then it's uh, permission is basically going to the specific uh, function you can define on the different uh, substitution and add more or add more access to it instead of uh, now having the service principles you should use the managed identity to secure it and uh, also put auth0 setup over here with open id or auth0 2.0 uh, so yeah that's about it there are still a lot of things that i wanted to go through but i think we are running out of time but what i'm gonna do is uh, i'm gonna share this uh, ppt and uh, this will give you all the different contexts so you basically can go through it and then if you to reach out to me if you have any doubts on it i will be happy to answer your questions i think i'm open for a question for a couple of minutes i think we are running out of time maybe um if we have a couple of questions i can i can take a couple of questions otherwise uh, we can wrap it up yeah participants if you have any questions uh, we can ask now if you are on unmute you can unmute yourself and you can ask uh, questions or you can send the questions in the chat yeah
it is basically azure functions is like uh, if you are creating anything related to the website actually we can make use of it correct uh it's mostly for for scenarios where you are running uh, some sort of a background job or some sort of apis which is not hosted or used 24 by 7. so it's for the backend services but okay. uh, no, like instead of creating a big monolithic application and have different APIs, you define an Azure functions for it and then use it for a scenario where it's not 100% used 24 by 7. So it Probably. will only be important when it's actually needed. Oh, for validation purpose, am I right? Forms validation and everything, correct? It could be used for those purposes as well. So instead of creating manually using the websites, uh, so Azure functions will uh, automatically give these options, correct? Yes. There are different triggers that you can identify and based on that you can use different uh, options. So the trigger is basically how a function will be invoked. So there are different options for it. You can have a queues when there is a new messages or HTTP trigger or when there is a new HTTP request or when whether there is a new prop going in in Azure or whether there is a new file uploaded to a storage account or sort of those things. So those, all those bindings are coming by default and you can make the most of it and build on top of it, the idea is to make uh, give you a platform, and you make the most of that platform and build on top of it with your specific requirements that you have for your uh, business case. Right. Basically, it is uh, you are spinning up the service uh, servers actually in on on requirement actually on demand. Correct. Yeah, when on demand. Need, uh, on demand. Correct. So instead of a dedicated server running twenty four by seven, you we are giving yeah. you the option of using it when it's needed so for example sorry to take your time more actually so when when it is go, going on live actually so it will run in cloud actually correct background yes. uh, it will spin up the services whenever is there is a user request and it will give the results correct Kevin. Okay. so it's so, it's on the cloud whenever you hit whenever the trigger is triggered right let's say you use http trigger so that means whenever there is http request that right. code will be automatically deployed to a server and then it automatically will serve you and then it will come back, give you right. the response. And then let's say if no no requests are coming, then it will go to the post mode and then you're not paying for the time it's uh, in the post mode. So it is like it is eliminating the traditional approach by dynamically acting on it. So you will get faster results, correct? Right. 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 Thanks, thanks, uh, Mohit. Thanks for your explanation. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, participants, uh, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and you can ask. Moreover, you can send your questions in the chat. Yeah. So let me proceed uh, to the certification desk. Let me share the screen. So, so participants, the, the speaker code for downloading the certificate for climbing the certificate is 5HDTM6. So let me share in the chart. So participants, I have shared the link uh, which you can use for climbing the certificate. Let me explain the process how to download the certificate. So once you uh, use the link, you'll be taken to this page. So now you can provide the credentials. You can provide your name, your email ID, 
and your uh, phone number and now you can register now you will be taken to the private dashboard this is a private dashboard you can find more options over here so now you can uh, for climbing the certificate uh, you can click climb certificate and now you can you can provide the secret code that is speaker code you can provide over here now i am providing the speaker, speaker code over here Now, the link to download the certificate will be sent to your mail ID. Okay, so this is a short process to download the certificate. Okay, so that's all from the certificate desk. So, any questions you can post in the chat. So, that's a wonderful session by Mohit Chapra, Microsoft Azure MVP. Um, we got a clear insight on how to create Azure functions by using Visual Studio and how to secure uh, Azure functions by different ways. So that's a good session. Once again, on behalf of Multicloud for you, uh, we like to thank uh, Mohit Chapra for giving an excellent session on uh, how to secure Azure functions. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thanks everyone uh, for being a part of this session. Have a great evening and bye-bye. Uh,